Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Primary Care Podcast. It's your boy, Dr. Mark List. Uh, today, we're going to hit up the primarycarepod at gmail.com inbox. That's where you can send me uh, feedback and things. Um, today's joke uh, is from an anonymous listener. Uh, Dr. List, with the higher price of gasoline worldwide right now, have you ever felt sweaty when you're putting gas in your car? Do you feel sick when you're paying for it? You probably have the coronavirus. Coronavirus. Car owner virus. Ooh, all right. Let's uh, let's start the podcast. Um, again, uh, any feedback you have for me, send me send it to me at primarycarepod at gmail.com. Anyways, uh, let's start the podcast. The Primary Care Podcast is written and by a family physician for an audience of other physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, residents, medical students, interested in primary care topics. This is not a podcast for patients and should not be used as medical advice. This is also a personal podcast produced on my own time and solely reflecting my personal opinions. Statements of this podcast do not reflect the views or policies of my employer, past or present, or any other organization with which I may be affiliated. Thank you for listening to the Primary Care Podcast. I'm Dr. Mark List. Here to bring you the latest news, guidelines, and updates from primary care sources around the globe. Keeping it under 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and I'm not that smart. Well, welcome back to the podcast, pod girls, pod boys, pod people. It's your boy, Dr. Mark List, uh, coming at you today with another episode of the Primary Care Podcast. Um, So uh, we are talking today. And this is another one of my practice efficiency things. Um, I've mentioned before on the podcast a while back, uh, we did an efficiency podcast um, on organizing your schedule. And here is, honestly, honestly, this is probably my favorite topic in all of my physician coaching I do, in all of my efficiency work I do, in my uh, medical information officer job I have. And that is documentation efficiency. Because it's such a massively important topic, and yet we really underestimate how how poorly prepared we are for it. Go back and look at your training. Medical school, um, if you're a nurse practitioner or PA, your your training, um, and even in residency, right? The first thing you learn how to do is you learn how to do an entire history and physical, ask every single question, review of systems, HPI, you know, do a billion points on your physical exam and you have this whole thing. And basically that, you know, taking past medical history, past social history, past sexual history, medications, allergies, and, and how often in regular clinical practice in the, you know, in the clinic standpoint from in a clinic, in the clinic world, do we actually do that? Right? Maybe if you have a new patient and you know nothing about them, you have no outside records, and then you have to get all that information. You know, that's the only time that we do that. And how often does that happen to you? Well, if you're a new provider, maybe that happens a lot more. Um, or maybe if you have a new practice, that happens a lot more. But for the overwhelming, probably 99% of your life as an outpatient clinical family doc, internal medicine doc, whatever. You don't do a whole H&P. And in fact, the newer coding and guideline changes that just the coding guideline changes that happened at the at the beginning of 2021 completely redid how we should focus on and how we should think about documentation. And here's a great article. You know me. I'm going to I'm going to focus all of my all of my uh, topics on actual research annals of. Annals of Internal Medicine, 2016. They did a review article using the Cerner EMR. Okay, I know a lot of you guys are epic. It's the most number one used in the world. Um, The things that EMR issues are EMR issues are EMR issues. It doesn't matter what EMR you have, right? Epic and Cerner being the two biggest ones. But, you know, there's a billion other EMRs. And all EMRs have the same issues. Some are better than others in some situations. But all of them have the same issues. And that is they take time. And... Again, going back to your training and how you were taught to document, a lot of us were trained in an era either right at the transition of EMRs or before transition of EMRs. Those who are younger than I am, right, I transitioned in the era of uh, medical records. But even if you're, you know, even if you're a medical student now, even if you're a resident now, even if you're in NP or PA school now, most of your life most of your training isn't focused on the EMR. It's on the medicine. But this article in the Annals of Internal Medicine 2016 showed that for every hour of direct patient care, the average 
outpatient clinician spent two hours in the EMR. And that's not just on documentation. That's on using the EMR in general. But of a physician's day, okay, in this article on, on the Cerner users, over 100 million Cerner users around the world were, were looked at, 27% of a physician's day was done with direct patient care, just face-to-face -face talking. And 49% was spent in the EMR. Again, not just all documentation. We'll get into that here in just a second. But think about that. One-fourth of your day is spent on direct patient care. 50% of your day is spent on EMR work. And that's not what you sign up for when you think you're going to medical school and you're going, you know, you're going to be a doctor and everything else like that, right? And that's the reality of modern day EMR and modern day being a physician, right? Now, some of that is, some of that's good time, right? Some of that is time where you're learning things about the patient, right? I'm seeing a patient back. And even if I'm reviewing my own note, that is data gathering that I don't have to waste in the patient room because the patient, now that we have electronic medical records, expects me to know about their, what's going on with them, right? So I have to read, re review my notes. So I remember, I don't look like an idiot that I don't remember what's going on with my pa own patient. Um, number two, um, I'm reading specialist notes. I'm looking at labs. I'm looking at x-rays. That data gathering part, that chart review part is important, right? That is, that is, you know, the same thing as if I was in the room with the patient and, you know, in the advent before EMRs, I'd have to sit in the room and talk with them and gather all that data. Now, in about one fourth the time compared to talking to them and having them tell me everything that happened, I'm able to get direct from the horse's mouth what happened and get the most accurate information. Okay. So there are, there isn't like, it's not all bad time, even though a lot of it is bad time. Okay. So of that, you know, 49% of the physician's day in this study that was in EMR work per clinic patient, the average physician, all specialties, spends 16 minutes and 14 seconds of EMR work per patient. 16 minutes in the EMR per patient. Now, how does that break down? About 33% of our time in this study that Cerner looked at how its users were spending the time, 33% were in chart and chart review and gathering data, right? Which makes sense. That's the majority of the bulk of our time. 25% was spent in documentation, all right? So that's about four and a half minutes per patient to document. And 17% of the time was spent, of that 60 minutes, was spent doing an order, or orders, plural, right? Order new meds, putting in uh, referrals, uh, doing labs, x-rays, etc. Now, primary care internal medicine, um, not surprisingly, had among, if not the highest amount of time per patient encounter in the EMR, up to 22 minutes on average, okay? So 22 minutes per clinic patient in the EMR, and 25% of that is in documentation. So on average, the average family medicine, primary care, internal medicine is spending almost five and a half minutes per document, per patient, okay? That, and, and here's the thing, we're gonna get into this. Sports medicine, physical medicine, rehab, PM&R, they average about eight to 10 minutes per patient. Okay, so much, much, much lower per patient. And that's, again, that's total EMR documentation time, uh, sorry, total EMR time. So documentation time being about a quarter of that, they're only spending about two minutes per patient on documentation, okay? 11% of all physician EMR time was spent after hours. So after 6 p.m., at nighttime, at weekends, et cetera. This is a problem, okay? This is a problem. Why? Because we are not trained very well on how to document efficiently, how to document in a way and use the EMR in a way that's efficient. Now, you've all had EMR training. I can guarantee you that. doesn't matter if you're Epic, doesn't matter if you're Cerner or, you know, all scripts or Meditech, it doesn't matter, right? You have been EMR trained, but most of it is just how to use the software, right? When you had your training, did you have a physician talk to you about how to use it as efficiently as you can? No, because most of the time it's just like, I, you know, and I do some of this training too, and I, I, I understand how bad it is because we have to tell in this training, and I say we as a trainer, we have to train every single user to be able to know all of the functionality, right? Yes, some organizations in some places um, have kind of more efficiency discussions, but most of the EMR training is just like, this is how you use the EMR. Here are the features that exist with it. 
it is really difficult, and we'll get into more of this, about teaching people how to be efficient with their documentation, okay? Now, when we talk about the average primary care slash internal medicine physician taking almost five and a half minutes per document, right? That's an issue because if you see, right, if you see 20 people a day, you know, that's well over an hour and a half just documenting, not even using the EMR, not doing anything else, but just doing notes, right? That's too high. Um, and most people, here's the issue. Most physicians do not even know how long it takes them to document, right? You say, how long does it take you to do a note? Oh, about probably under two minutes, right? And when you actually watch and put a stopwatch on people, the people have no idea how long it takes them to document. And I didn't realize how long it took me to document using some ways until I actually st stopwatched myself. Okay, we'll get into that later. But this is a problem. You do not need to take five minutes to do a document in the, in the outpatient setting, in the clinic setting. The 2021 CPT EM&M chain coding changes were specifically designed to help with this in clinic, right? No longer do you have to have paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of HBI. No longer do you have to do unnecessary, you know, ROS that has no benefit in the clinic, right? Asking a billion things about, you know, just to get points to, to be able to upcode, right? To be able to code a 99214 and 99215, right? You no longer have to do that. You no longer have to have specific non-relevant physical exam you know, documentation. So not only do you not have to do it with the patient, but you also don't need to document if it's completely irrelevant to why they're here, right? If you're here for anxiety or depression and all you're doing is talking to the patient, you literally don't, you, you basically just have to do a brief mental exam that basically says like they're not suicidal, their affect is normal, their mood is normal, right? That can literally be a sentence. You don't need to document anything else for physical exam, right? No psychomotor agitation. Fantastic, right? Um, and you probably don't even have to say that. You can probably just say like mood and affect are normal, alert oriented, no passive suicide, no passive suicide, no passive or active suicide ideation noted. Boom, you're done, right? And yet I still see physicians when I do my physician coaching way over document because the majority of physicians, I can tell you, nurse practitioners, PAs have not adapted to the 2021 CPT e &M coding changes. Why? Well, this is probably how we were trained, right? Literally, habit and muscle memory makes up such a huge percent of why we use the EMR and how we work in the EMR, how we work in the EMR is because it is either how I was trained initially, how I started using it initially, and I never changed. I use the EMR how I've always used the EMR, and it takes mental effort and it takes diligence and an active plan by you to make habit changes in the EMR, to change the way that you use the EMR. And I'll tell you, it makes a, a, a tremendous amount of difference uh, assessing this, right? Why are you on this podcast right now? Why are you listening to this podcast? Because you want to get better at your job, right? I'm not offering you CME. Sorry, guys, I wish I could. Um, I'm not offering you CME. You're here because you want to be a better doctor. You want to be better for your patients. You want to be up to date. And it's also passive. You know, you can be doing this while you're driving the car, jogging, going on the treadmill, lifting weights, doing the dishes, folding laundry, right? You can you can kind of passively get improve on yourself. We all don't want to look like an idiot in clinic. And so we try to learn guidelines. We try to learn, you know, the, how to be the best physician that we can be. But we waste hours. Physicians waste hours of their life you know, hours, weeks of their lives, if you add up the time, in being inefficient in the EMR. And yet most physicians don't take the time or effort to improve on themselves in the EMR. When this study shows that you spend twice as much time in the EMR than you do with the patient. Okay. So also people fear kind of the fear of litigation, but anybody will tell you, any study will tell you, any look at malpractice will tell you that yes, the EMR is basically your shield to basically defend what you do. But the EMR isn't the reason why most people get sued, right? The EMR is not the reason that you're going to get sued. Having a terrible relationship with that patient or not listening to the patient or not having those face-to-face -face conversations and those shared patient decision makings, that's where people get sued. When mistakes are made and physicians ignore patient requests or physicians just do a bad job and don't include the patients in the decision-making when it's just, oh, we're doing this and I'll see you back. And like, you know, 
and they never discuss with the patient fears, concerns, worries. And guess what? All the time that you spend to justify your position in the EMR is far more valuable spent in verbal communication with the patient. And then in the EMR saying, shared patient decision-making, discuss with patient what we're going to do today and why we're doing it, right? That two sentence basically explains the fact that you've had these conversations about your thought process and why you're doing this with the patient and that you're including them in decision-making, right? Which everybody knows if you do any of the update, you know, looking at up-to-date guidelines and recommendations for us family docs, it's all, okay, let's share the decision-making. Let's include patients in why we are thinking the way that we are thinking, right? No longer just like, I'm in charge. You listen to me. We're doing it because I say so, right? And people also over-document because they feel like the patient's want to know or to see that you've done everything. But as somebody that's really truncated my documentation the last couple of years, I don't, and and you probably get this too. Now that patients have access to their own notes, most of the time people call back and are like, oh, you documented something that wasn't right. I never get, oh, you didn't document the fact that I asked you about my big toe looks funny or, you know, that spot on the back of my right shoulder, you didn't mention that in your note, right? Um, or, or that's probably a bad example. But like all of those fine little small details that I don't put in there that aren't relevant at all, I've never had a patient contact me. But I have had my patient contact me and say, hey, you, you mentioned this. That's not actually real or that's actually not actually true that, or that, that isn't relevant anymore, right? Can you take that out of my record? You know, those are the things that I have patients, you know, portal me back and say, hey, my note says this, you know, that's not true anymore. That diagnosis isn't true. When you over-document, more of the time, patients are more nitpicky about their notes than if you under-document. I, and it's at least in all of my experience in talking with other physicians. And, and again, if you have a different, if you have a different take on this, I'm open to hearing about this. Finally, a lot of physicians over-document because they think I need to do this for patient safety. I need other physicians to be able to see everything that we talked about. And so they have these massive HPIs with multiple paragraphs. I will tell you, even in the most complicated of patients and most complicated of situations, I can't ever remember. Well, think about it. Think about it. how often do you go and you, you see somebody and they saw one of your partners. How often do you read the entirety of that note? Zero, zero, zero. You maybe skim some of the HPI to get a sense of what's going on. Maybe when it's really complicated, you go back and look at the story just to see so you don't have to repeat all those same questions. But again, sometimes I ask those questions, again, to validate. And I say, you know, tell me more about this. I read Dr., you know, Dr., let's just make up a name, Dr. Jones's notes, right? And and I want to hear the story, though, from you to get a fresh perspective on it, Right. That's one way that, you know, you can say like, hey, by the way, I did the work. I, I, you know, I know your past history, but I want to hear the story fresh from you again, um, just to see if I miss up any clues that maybe Dr. Jones didn't get, right? If I'm, if I'm following up on this, but then most of us just spend our time reading the plan, right? Tell me about your, why you did, why you did what you did, just medical decision-making. And oftentimes that's a simple couple of sentences, right? When you're communicating with other physicians, it's justifying why you did it, why I ordered, why I didn't order, why I tro- chose this med, what my next plan is, what my next step is in case my partner has to see them, right? And that's just medical decision-making. I'm not, I'm not asking them to, I'm not, you know, most physicians aren't going to read your entire note. They're especially barely going to touch your physical exam. They're not going to touch your review of systems. They're not going to do any of that stuff, right? And, you know, people that say like, oh, I want to put all my labs and x-rays in this note. Well, if they're in your system, they're not looking in your note for that stuff. They're looking on the chart for that stuff. Now, if you send to an outside lab, okay, maybe there's some justification, but that's old school, right? That's old paper charts. I'm going to get this paper faxed to somebody because nobody else can see this EMR. So therefore, I want all my labs and x-rays in there. So I want to bloat my note as much as possible. That way, the specialist who sees this, you know, sees everything. If they're in your system or if you're an Epic user and they're in, they're in an Epic system, there's no point in doing that anymore, right? Now that most physicians can easily have EMR access just to view only, there's no point in doing that anymore. It's just bloating your note and making it harder to read and taking more time of your time that you think, oh, I'm doing a good thing by doing this. No, you're doing a terrible thing. You're over-documenting. You're, du- you're duplicating stuff that's already in, in the EMR just to justify some 
mental thing that you set up in training that you were taught by some physician or you heard or that you have a mental block on that says, I need to put all these things in here and take the time, take my precious time during the day to add all these notes, add all these labs, add all these x-rays. And the only person that you're benefiting is your own mental issues. I'm, I'm being harsh to you people, not you, all you people, but you specific users when you are now duplicating a process, you are double documenting, you are unnecessarily doing something only to justify your own psychoses. Okay. Not psychoses. That's the wrong word. Uh, your own fears. Okay. Let's look at the 2021 guideline changes, right? For the CPT and ENM coding changes, right? Specifically, it allowed us to choose if we wanted to use, if we want to document based on medical decision making, right? Not choosing HBI number of elements and number of review of systems elements, review of exam elements. Again, we talked about this in a previous podcast. Um, if you go back to 2020 September, um, I, I, I talked about that. Or now document based on time, right? So we can justify the time we spent not only documenting, right? Right? You can say, I spent 31 minutes with the patient and documenting and chart reviewing. All of that time that the annals of internal medicine say we spend on a patient, right? On average, 16 minutes for primary care, 22 minutes. You should never document anything. Uh, basically, this tells you, hey, you're you're safe documenting on time for 22 minutes on every single patient just on average, right? Um, and changing the requirements for medical decision making was another big thing, right? So it changed the fact that we don't need all those elements, that we can justify it based on are we prescribing medicines? Is this a high risk situation? How many chronic diseases? How many active diseases? Again, go back and read that, uh, listen to that podcast episode again back from like September or November of 2020 when they were making the changes. And and so let's take a step back, right? And look holistically at, at a big picture. Why do we document clinic, right? Number one, coding billing, right? Either we need to get paid or our employer needs to get paid and then they pay us, right? So we can get our production bonus and our RVU reimbursement, okay? Number two, and probably the most important thing, patient care and safety, Right? We document because it's important for our patients that the information that they tell us is in the chart, right? The fact that what we do and why we did it is in there. So they, so we can kind of um, figure this out, right? We need to know, we need to have their, you know, allergies documented. We need to know accurately what their meds are and what their problem lists are and what their, what their past surgeries are, right? We need to document because it's for patient safety. We document to communicate with other healthcare workers, but again, we talked about this, right? The majority of us, when we go back and look at notes, it's really just the medical decision-making, the plan section, right? Why we are doing what we are doing. Yes, we care about the HBI, but how much detail do you really care about in that HBI, right? I, when, when a, when a, as an, as an attending, right? As somebody who's been out of practice, who's been out of residency now for seven years, had six or seven medical students with me now, uh, nurse practitioner students, um, when when uh, when an, when somebody who is with you working under you right gives you the story right yes initially you want them to tell you all the details and give you a detailed message but eventually what do we really want to know why is the patient here give us the pertinent positives right and then some pertinent negatives avoid all the other garbage and just get to the point right and with the HPI oftentimes when you're writing three or four paragraphs you're burying the important information as a, as a partner or as a consult, as, as somebody who's you're consulting, I don't need four paragraphs of information. Almost, almost never, almost never do I need four paragraphs of information. And almost never is your specialist, your orthopedic surgeon going to read four paragraphs of HBI information, right? Almost never. And so by over-documenting the HBI, especially, you're probably harming your document more than you are helping your document. Because you're burying the important stuff in a mound of extraneous garbage. In the in the sake of being complete, you are losing the message that you need to be sending. And it's only hurting you. Your specialist is just, just going to skim what you write, right? And all of those details that you are putting in that, you have to mentally get over that because you are only harming yourself here. And then, again, fourth thing is, we're use the note now in modern days to communicate with the family and the patient, right? I have many family members who their older mom or dad, grandma and grandpa don't use their portal. They don't use their my chart, right? But the siblings, the 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 children or the grandchildren are the ones that are reading my notes because they don't come along with grandma and grandpa, but they're the ones who have proxy access and they want to know what's going on with with me and with the specialists. And so again, they can review the notes 
and what they care about, yes, they but they know the HBI story. They know what's going on with the patient. They want to know what the plan is, what the medical decision making is, what the meds are, what the next steps are, what the specialists were referring to, what the x-ray showed, right? What the what the game plan is if this first thing, if this first medicine doesn't work, what's the second, third steps, right? They care about the medical decision making. So why does the average family doc take almost five and a half minutes per patient just to document? Physicians don't realize how much time they're spending in documentation. Okay. How long does it take you to do a, a, a pink eye note? You can estimate it, but do you know? How long does it take you? You're in the document, you click document in the chart in, you know, whatever Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, Meditech, you pull it up, right? You start doc before you start typing. How long does it take you from start to finish to sign? How do you know if it's an issue with your own workflow if you don't have if you don't know how long it takes? How long does it take your partners to document? You ever talk about that? We often get into this sense of like, oh, I must be efficient because my notes are done before I leave. My notes are done within 24 hours after I see the patient. I'm efficient. Are you? Self-measure. We take boards, we review, we take CME to kind of check on our own knowledge. We listen to podcasts. Those of you who are listening to this, right? You listen to podcasts because you want to have the, you want to be up to date. You want to be good at your job. Do you care that you're inefficient, that you're wasting hours of your life at the EMR, Right. We have no direct observation, right? You get into practice, you know, you stop being a student, you get into practice, you're, you're no longer a learner. You're the attending now. You are on your own. Maybe if you're a nurse practitioner, PA listen to this, you have somebody kind of reading your notes, but most of the time they're just signing off on what you do. You know that. Um, there's very few, uh, you know, attendings that actually go through and read every single note and critique. Some of you, maybe that happens, but most of the time you're on your own, right? You're on your own. We're thrown to the wolves. Are you efficient? Nobody, nobody watches me document. Nobody does, right? We don't know what we don't know about our use of the EMR, okay? Inefficiencies. We have guidelines and recommendations for a huge part of medicine now, right? But we don't have guidelines and recommendations for documentation, for ordering, for chart navigation. What benchmark? What is, is it really five and a half minutes per patient? Is the average doc on Cerner, that's how much time they spend documenting for family practice? Really? Four and a half for every physician? That's how long it takes you to do a document? Is that the benchmark? Is that what the metric should be? Right? We don't have how and how do we how do we find these benchmarks? Direct observation and best practice creation among you and your partners. Okay? Over documentation is why it takes five and a half minutes. Because the guideline changes came out. And I will tell you, again, 20% of my job is working with EMR efficiency, is physician coaching, is is talking to physicians about this. I will literally go and watch them document. Hey, no, I will, sometimes I'll have them, I'll sit in the room behind them and, you know, with my arms crossed, like I'm some, you know, tough, you know, whatever guy, but I, all I'm doing is watching where they're clicking. I don't even care what the pay, what they're talking about with the patients. I'm not judging them on if they're a good doc or not. I literally just care where are they clicking? What are they doing in the EMR? Right. When they come out of the room and they're, and they're documented, if they're not documented in the room, right. How long does it take them to do this? Could they be more efficient? Are they over-documenting? Are they not using their chart prep time efficiently? Are they not starting their document when they're chart prepping when they should be, right? Um, but over-documenting is a huge issue, right? Bloated HBIs are the most common thing. Unnecessary physical exams, now incredibly common. And yet there are, I mean, probably 25% of physicians, NPs, PAs, change their practice based on the guidelines, uh, the new 2021 updates and the e &M documentation changes. But I will tell you, the majority of physicians that I watch and work with have not changed their practice at all from two years ago, right? Pre-pandemic till now. They document the exact same. Their templates are the exact same. Their dot phrases are the exact same. Everything is the exact same. It's like these changes happened. And the only thing that changed is the fact that like, I don't have an, I don't have an ROS anymore. Right. Or, or I am not, or like now I document based on time because I spend so much time in with the patient. Right. They didn't change how they documented. They didn't get rid of paragraphs of information. They didn't cut out minutes off of their documentation time, which over the course of a day is hours in some cases. Right. These changes were designed to free you of the shackles of inefficient documentation and barely anybody changed and adapted. Okay. Another issue, why are we in this case where it takes five and a half minutes to document? Because of training, right? 
a lot of us trained in the era of paper charts and classical transcription. I'm just talking on a phone and somebody else is documenting for me, right? In the EMR, they ha and, and, and now with Dragon and Modal, voice to text communication, dot phrases, quick text, templates, y you name it, right? Um, copy forward, copy pasting. You can have so many tools at your disposal now. Most, most organizations, not all organizations, some of you guys are in cheap places that don't have a lot of these tools, right? I apologize for that. But many of you guys are in world-class healthcare organizations or, or at least healthcare organizations that are providing you with a glut of tools, some tools that you have never even utilized, right? You have never even thought to utilize them. And they are there to make you more efficient, to save you clicks, to save you time in your day, and you're not even trying them. Not even trying them, okay? And I'm not going to make you into Mark List, right? When I work with physicians one-on-one, -on -one, I don't tell I don't tell them and say, this is how you have to use the EMR, right? Because I have partners that if I told them, use a dot phrase, use a quick text, and get them off of kind of dictating using Dragon and Modal, the voice-to-text communication, they would be less efficient, right? They That is not my point. My point is, are there scenarios that you could benefit using this sometimes. Could you do this and and benefit? Can you change the way that you document using your preferred method and be 10% more efficient? 10% more efficient, right? If you are if it takes you 330 seconds, that's five and a half minutes, okay, easy math. And 10% less time is 30 seconds. 30 seconds times 20 patients is 10 minutes per day. Per week, that's almost an hour of documentation time. Just being five, just 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 being ten percent more efficient is almost an hour of your week saved. If you see twenty people a day, think about that. And that's just for documentation. That's just for documentation. That's not chart prep. That's not or that's not ordering. That's nothing else. If you can be ten percent more efficient with your documentation, it saves you an hour of your life. Okay. Why does it take five and a half minutes to document? in family practice and internal medicine, note bloat. Note bloat. Note bloat. The idea that your epic document has to be seven pages long, that your Cerner note for a pink eye needs to be three pages, right? Now, a lot of this stuff is brought in. Yes, a lot of this stuff is stuff that you are not bringing in, right? But this idea now that in the modern day that we still need that our one document has to be the source of truth and recreate other parts of the EMR into our document is just bananas. And I see this more with hospital documentation, right? Every day I'm bringing all the things that I'm bringing from yesterday's documentation into today's documentation. Now, yes, yes, inpatient documentation did not get the same updates that we did in terms of, in terms of trying to limit this, right? They didn't get the e &M documentation changes. That's only for ambulatory. That's only for clinic, okay? Yes, yes. But have you ever tried to read a hospitalist note? My God, can you tell what happens day to day? Right? You can't. You can't. You absolutely can't. Have you read some specialist notes? Nephrology. Like, like it, it can be like the exact same note. Copy and paste it day after day after day after day. I try to follow along what's going on in the hospital. I have no idea, right? Imagine now you are a specialist reading a clinic note and you see that Dr. Jones has dictated four paragraphs in the HBI and I'm being consulted about like a sentence in that note. Like I'm not even going to read it. I'm just going to walk in the room and I'm going to ask the patient, what brings you in today? And that's what a lot of them do, right? A lot of specialists don't even read our consult notes, right? And and some of it's because some of the consults um, are self. They don't know if it's being referred by a physician or it's being referred self-referred. And so some of them just, you know, just say, hey, what brings you in? Tell me what's going on. What do you, you know, what brings you in? Or if the nurse has already done it, then they just follow up from what the nurse says, right? But we are spending hours of our life bloating these notes, adding, adding labs, uh, taking time out of our day to throw in uh, labs to, you know, put in the radiologists, um, copy and paste the radiologist stuff. Like, think about how much time you spend adding stuff to your note, that especially if you are in a system that your specialist and you and your hospital and your ER are all in the same, are all in the same um, EMR system, your clinic, your ER, your hospital are all in the same EMR, you're completely wasting your entire time. Every minute you're doing that is a complete and total waste. Okay. 
Now, if you're in a spot where you're just a standalone clinic and a lot of your specialists and all of your specialists in your hospital and your are outside, maybe there's more justification. Maybe. Okay. But again, then if you do want to take the time to put in labs, x-rays, radiology reports, etc., okay, that's a little bit more justified. But at the same time, I can almost guarantee you, again, in the modern era, that all of those specialists, all of those physicians have access to your EMR. I, I shouldn't say all, and not in all cases, but many of them do. And many of them request your records anyways, right? And they get, you know, a lot of this information, okay? And so then maybe if that's in your scenario, your note bloat, there's some justification to it, right? But there is so much note bloat in the HBI and review of systems and exam that just doesn't need to be there, period, no matter the situation, okay? Now, what's next, okay? I am way, 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 way over my time, okay? I'm way over my time that I normally do. And you're probably like, oh my God, this is currently double how long it normal podcast is for you, Dr. List. I'm going to pause here and we're going to do another episode just because I like to keep these podcasts short. But episode two is going to be on what's next. How do you fix it? What are the steps that you have to take to fix this issue and gain hours of your life back, right? And we'll also tie into, okay, maybe I am efficient, right? I I think my no time is way under that, right? It takes me, um, and by the way, how long does it take me to do these things, right? If it's a single problem, urgent care type visit, um, influenza, COVID, et cetera, I can do that note in 25 seconds, okay? Start to finish, open, click the document. Once it loads, God, uh, my EMR loading time can be of an issue. I'm sure yours can too. Once like it is loaded, me like starting to type or dragon or whatever, a single problem, I can do it in 25 seconds, okay? Okay, on average, and I've done the math, right? My mean, my mean for all documentation is 55 seconds. For an H&P, it's just under two minutes, Okay. For a chronic disease recheck, huge variability, huge, depends on how complicated it is versus how I can just copy and paste, right? If it's a nursing home visit from two months ago and I'm not doing much, that's, you know, 15, 30 seconds, right? Um, if it's, if it's, you know, very multiple, you know, diabetes, hypertension, uh, I'm talking about a bunch of stuff. I'm doing healthcare maintenance in there too. I'm updating things again, you can use the tools that your EMR has, well, most of you have, and you can make it more efficient. Again, if I ever spend more than two minutes documenting anything, I'm probably doing something wrong or it's the one in a th- one in a thousand patient visit scenario, one in several hundred, you know, type issue where it is just that complicated and needs that much time and multiple paragraphs, multiple, multiple paragraphs in the medical decision making. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap up for today. Okay. And we're going to jump right again. I'm going to probably release these like back to back. I'll probably start recording this while I'm uploading this one. Um, actually just kidding. I can't, I have something I gotta do right now. Um, but at the same time, right, we're going to jump right into what's next. What if you are efficient? Okay. What if your documentation time actually is efficient, but maybe you struggle with other things with documentation or chart review. We'll get into some of that here in a little bit. Okay. So, um, Wow. Yeah, that is. I looked at my time. It's almost 40 minutes. Wow. Okay. Reminder, you don't need to stay up to date. You don't need to stay up all night to stay up to date. You do need to stay up to date. Um, You don't need to stay up all night to do your notes. You don't need to stay up all night to be efficient with the EMR, right? Uh, This has been Dr. Mark List. We'll get back here with you with the primary care uh, pod in just a second. Um, But uh, thanks. God bless. Have a great week.